All right, welcome back to you, Trinidad and Tobago. It's the Morning Brew here on CNC3. I am Natalie Lagor. We do have on Zoom with us this morning uh, lawyer Martin George to talk about the constitutionality of a TNT nationals having to seek an exemption to return to this country. Good morning to you, Mr. George. Hi, good morning to you, Natalie. Good morning, Akash. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. And Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, thank morning, you, and sir. the very best to you as well. So what, what exactly is the issue? Is it legal or illegal for a government to say to a national that you need to seek an exemption to return to your country of birth? Well, the point is, Natalie, we have to understand, first and foremost, we are not in normal times. It's not a normal scenario. And, of course, while one does have to respect the constitutional rights of persons, there is always the overarching power of cabinet by way of the constitution, which has empowered cabinet to have overall direction for Trinidad and Tobago to determine what is best in each and every situation. And given what has occurred with the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously the government has taken a decision, as have several other governments around the world, that look, the best way is to also close our borders and to limit the inflows and outflows of our persons, our citizens, begin to either enter or to leave the country. So while we recognize on one hand the constitutionality of persons' rights, you know, we also recognize that there is a greater responsibility on the government to manage this situation. And any court, I think, looking at this would also engage in that type of balancing act. Yeah, but people, people think they're being cheated here in the process. So apart from, um, from the right to freedom of movement, um, there's also the argument that uh, people have a, a right to equality of treatment by a public authority. Could they have a case there? All right, okay. So let's just look at them in turn. When you speak of the right to freedom of movement, I am not entirely convinced at all that if you are out of the borders of Trinidad and Tobago, that you can make any claim for right of freedom of movement. So in other words, that right to freedom of movement must pertain to you being within the space of Trinidad and Tobago. So I can't see someone outside saying, well, you are restricting my right to freedom of movement by not letting me come back into the country. I think it has to be framed another way. In terms of the equality of treatment, that can only go to the issue of the granting of the exemptions. But because each and every situation and scenario is unique and particular, it's very, very difficult to make a case for equality, inequality of treatment. There have been several cases from the Privy Council which deal with this whole scenario of how you treat with inequality of treatment, and they all show that you must establish a comparator. In other words, there must be someone who is similarly circumstanced as closely as possible to you. But the point is, each and everybody's situation is not always the same. Yeah, but Mr. George, the thing is that even though the situations may not be the same, is that what you have, what they have in common is that one, they're TNT nationals, two, they're all outside the borders of TNT, and three, they all have to apply for exemptions. Isn't that yeah, enough grounds in terms of, you know, similarities to say, okay, okay here's the right, scenario. So let, 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 let's, let's use an example. Let's say, for instance, let's look at the situation with those who went to Canada um, to engage in the farm program. All right. If you recall Natalie and Akash, firstly, they protested to the government that the government was not allowing them to leave, and they said that it was interfering with their right to earn a livelihood, and they will file constitutional motions. The government eventually relented, granted them the exemptions, and said, well, listen, guys, remember, once you go, there's no guarantee that we can accommodate you to return you. When they were finished with their farm program, they then started protesting that they must be allowed back into the country. They must be allowed to back home, you know, and the government said, but hey, we told you that you signed your agreement that, look, you understood the circumstances. So therefore, there are others waiting ahead of you. So therefore, it can't be that you, because you are now finished, you must demand that you must be put ahead of the others and you must come home now. Then now the latest we're hearing is that having now facilitated them with the exemption, 
apparently the majority of, of them are now saying, look, we're going to stay anyhow because apparently the Canadian government has facilitated them with housing, clothing, allowances. Um, they've given them work permits provisionally that they could work otherwise. And the next cycle of the farm program starts back in April. So now they're saying, well, we don't need the exemptions anymore. So you, you, you can't just use a broad brush in these circumstances and say, well, look, simply because a citizen demands this, that you not treating with it urgently is a denial of their rights. You know, there have been arguments where people are saying that there isn't even a need for an exemption policy. Where do you stand on that? Well, I can't imagine how one would establish the criteria if you didn't have an exemption policy. The only way you could not have the exemption policy is if you have your borders open. But even a cash, let's think of it, in a normal scenario where there's free travel in and out of the country, remember under the conditions of the Immigration Act and under the provisions of the Ministry of National Security, you then still have the authority to um, deny persons entry. If you remember that um, case that was brought by uh, Mr. Jones um, a couple of ago, where he actually one of the restrictions which was it was an archaic provision which was based upon homosexuality that you know the ministry had the, the permission and power to deny someone based upon that you know and he was able to successfully challenge that in the court so the point is there are provisions which allow people so if you are a known terrorist if you are a known gun runner or a smuggler that kind of thing the, the government always has basically an exemption list <laughs> in that right. sense it's well, just but, that they've expanded it now. But let us say, even with an exemption list, is it that the pandemic allows the government to suspend the rights of citizens so that it could say, you know, in this case, you still need an exemption to come home? Well, it's not as, as simplistic as saying it's a suspension of your rights. As I say, mm -hmm. it's really a balancing act. In other words, the, you, you look for what is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So in other words, I may have an individual right to freedom of expression, but that is balanced by laws which guard against like public use of obscene language and you know that kind of thing. So therefore, even though I may have that individual right, it is still balanced by what is the greater good that you control the use of language in public, that kind of thing. So there's always that balance and act even with rights. Because remember, with rights come responsibilities. It, it can't just be a one-way street. So I mean, maybe what it really needs then is a transparent process. Because if, you, if we work with the argument that there has to be, and there has always been some kind of exemption process in place, for anybody entering the country, what can we do to make it more transparent so that people aren't questioning what exactly is happening, especially when you see, you know, the daughters, the, the, the prime minister's daughter is returned, the attorney general's son is returned. What can we do to make the, the, the process more transparent? Right, so I think that what can be done, and maybe there can be some broad guidelines established and published, and maybe there ought to be a greater public relations campaign to explain to people because let me tell you sometimes I'll, uh, what i've learned in life natalie and akash many times these situations are born out of either ignorance lack of communication lack of understanding so i think the more the government you know gets that message out there to say well look these are the broad guidelines and i'll tell you it has to be broad because you cannot detail in minute each and every scenario I mean, I can give you one unique scenario. For instance, there was a national who wished to return, who applied for the exemption, got the exemption, but it turns out that he also wanted to bring back the ashes of his dead wife. And in those circumstances, he then had to get permission from the host country where he was, then get permission from Trinidad and Tobago. So therefore, he therefore lost his place in the line, in the exemption line. Now, how do you regulate or, you know, put something like that on a list to say, well, these are the criteria? Who would even contemplate a scenario such as that? And that's a real live example I'm telling you about. So the point is, you can't detail it in minute but maybe some broad guidelines could be published and made available and you would also always
states have to put the caveat and rider that this does not mean there's a guarantee. So in other words, it's an opportunity for you to apply and be considered, but it can't be a guarantee that you would be granted. Yeah, but do you think government even knows its own policy? Because uh, in November it was reported um, by CNC3, a very uh, credible source, that the Minister of National Security said government's priority is to deal with applications on a first-come, first-served basis. A month later, uh, we have the Minister of National Security saying, well, that's not the case. Uh, where, where do you think government really stands on that? Well, I mean, I can't speak for the government, and I mean, I'm not <laughs> empowered to, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think that if it is they themselves were to issue a policy document, but as I say, with broad guidelines, then of course, we can then all hold them to that standard because we can say, well, look, this is what you've published. Right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that they publish it. The last time I spoke with the Minister of National Security, he did indicate that, I mean, apart from first come, first serve, they were looking at age, you know, how long you were outside, why you got caught outside, if you were elderly, if you had children, medical conditions. So you're right, there are so many moving parts that the government yeah. has to consider. Yeah. But at this point, to the nationals who are outside, what, what do we say to them? Well, I mean, I can understand the human element in the scenario because, I mean, it is not um, an easy situation if you are in a foreign country where you're not comfortable, where you may be facing, you know, extreme cold and, you know, loneliness, depression. I, I can understand and I certainly empathize with those persons in that scenario. However, we do also have to understand that it is a difficult and tricky balancing act. Look at Barbados. Barbados had opened their borders freely and now Barbados is back on a curfew. You know, you see what has happened in London. So it, it's, it's, it's a moving target all the time. So, I mean, back to the point that Akash was making in terms of, the, you know, the government saying that it's a first come, first served basis. But, and that might have been the initial idea. But the point is it may be first come, first served, but I guess it's who eats the meal before who. And that's the point. Do you believe that there was anything unfair in the Attorney General's son and the Prime Minister's daughter being brought back when one, I don't know when the Attorney General's son applied for exemption, but we heard, heard that the Prime Minister's daughter applied for exemption in sometime in November. Do you believe there was anything unfair in the system? Well, unless I have the facts, it's not even possible for me to begin to contemplate a comment on that. I don't have the facts in terms of the dates of applications, so I would not engage in speculation um, on those matters. Well, those things would have fueled a lot of distrust. Now, personally, I'm asking, uh, do you think the final decision on exemptions uh, should have been left to, to a politician, should have been left to a minister? Well, the thing is, remember, it does come under the portfolio of the Ministry of National Security, and he is the line minister. So, therefore, I don't think that there's any question as to, you know, the authority in that regard. So, unless we change the Constitution and we change the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, I think that's the way it will have to be. And the point is, um, when you refer to it um, as coming under a politician, then, I mean, of course, you have to ask yourself, unless it is that it's shown that for some political reason there has been some either abuse or misuse of the power which of course is open to challenge in the courts if that is proven then otherwise um it would appear that we ought to basically follow it what is our legislation at this point right and you know what i thought about mr george what about those people who aren't even nationals but residents who are caught outside you know, can't they, you know, if, if even not the constitutionality of being stuck outside of a country that they work in and live in, what about for loss of earnings? Because if people are stuck for so long, it might mean loss of jobs, it might mean, you know, losing earnings. Can't they challenge on that point? Right. And Natalie, that would be immediately met with the argument that you can those who are right here in Trinidad and Tobago, the hundreds or maybe thousands of citizens who have lost their jobs through the COVID-19 pandemic, 
who therefore can say, well, look, my livelihood has been affected and I'm right here in Trinidad and Tobago. So how do you even go to consider somebody who is not even a national, who is outside of Trinidad and Tobago before you consider me? Look at the situation. Look, Hilton has announced that they may lay off 100 workers. There are some realities that we have to face and understand that this is not a normal situation. And I think certainly in that scenario, there will be consideration of the nationals who are here, who are without a job and without livelihood. And I would certainly give my heart out to them first before considering non-nationals who are outside of the country complaining that they can't come to Trinidad and Tobago and so, earn a living. Mr. George, let me play devil's advocate. So if I reach out to you tomorrow, I'm a national and I'm stuck outside Trinidad and Tobago, and I reach out to you as a, as a, as a skilled lawyer to represent my case because I want to challenge this government for being locked outside, you wouldn't take the case? Well, the thing is, one doesn't likely refuse a request for a brief from a client. But the point is, in a scenario such as that, what would be the most prudent course of action would be that you would first advise the client that, look, it may be best if I do a legal opinion showing you the merits and demerits of your scenario. So based upon that legal opinion, you can then make a decision as to whether you wish to go forward with it. So in other words, once you are fully apprised that, look, there's like a very slim chance of success and you still insist after having read and perused my legal opinion that you want to make the application, then there's no harm in making the application because at the end of the day, the government may, for whatever reason, decide to grant it because as you yourself said, there are lots of moving parts. So maybe there may be something in that particular client's scenario that might trigger you know, some sort of relief. And I mean, of course, if they hear an important name like Natalie, you know, they will say, well, yes, definitely. <laughs> that ought to be given consideration. <laughs> I know, right? But but have you had any such any such approach for citizens to stock abroad? Yes, you know, we've applied and we have gotten we've gotten exemptions for clients. We've applied, yes, we've we've gone through the process and stuff like that. But we've laid out a full and proper case for those whom we've gotten for. You know, and we've been quite grateful for um, the opportunity to at least facilitate them in that regard. But the point is, similarly, if it is that the government wrote back and gave cogent or compelling reasons as to why they could not facilitate it at that time, then, of course, similarly, we would have to explain to the client that, look, this is what they are saying. So final word, you don't believe that there is any chance of success at the courts in challenging the exemption process? Well, the point is, let me tell you, eh? the law is a living, breathing, dynamic thing, and it is something that must always be tested because that's how the law develops and grows. And uh, you know what I love about Trinidad and Tobago? We are in the Caribbean at the forefront of legal challenges in terms of pushing the envelope. You know, in the areas of judicial review, constitutional law, there's no other island in the Caribbean that is even close to us. They look to us as the leaders to always be the trendsetters and to create the precedents. So I think it's great when people mount the challenges because that's the way the law develops and grows. You look at um, some of the historic cases in Trinidad and Tobago, say for instance, like the Trinity Cross case, the radio license case, and several others, which tested the law in the areas of judicial review we really are the leaders so of course persons are always welcome to try because the doors of the courts are open that doesn't mean you necessarily will succeed okay look at for instance justice sipasad and his ruling recently with the venezuelan migrants you know it was hailed in many quarters as a success but then when that judgment went up to the Court of Appeal, you saw how the two Court of Appeal judges, they totally excoriated and eviscerated Justice Sipasad's judgment, you know? Right. So the point is, they, they put a totally different spin on the thing, and, you know, their, their ruling totally right. destroyed um, thank you, what Thank you very much, uh, Mr. George. Unfortunately, we have to take a break because we have the 7 o'clock news. Thank you very much for your expertise, sir. Have a great day. Thank have you. A and have a good morning. Yes. Sir.